we're looking at a description where it into, into 1 John, the, the, into the verses 15 following. <clears throat> and I want us to see, uh, kind of get in our minds, when we think about uh, little children and we see about fathers and we see about the, the young men, we see them distinguished between in verses 12 following. And I want us to see what, you know, what well, that might be, they're just new Christians. Little children may be just new Christians and they, their sins are forgiven. They know the father. And then the fathers have known the Lord from the beginning and the young men are strong. And so there's your strong Christians and we've got to be careful. He does make those distinctions, but all of the Christians are little children. Is he not addressing this epistle to Christians? And it's just not little children who have just become obedient to the gospel. Because of verse 18, little children, it is the last hour. In 1 John 5, 21, he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. So all the Christians are little children. All the Christians are fathers. All the Christians are strong men. That's what we're supposed to be. But he looks at that as, as what would be connected with little children in a family relationship. And that's what we <clears throat> pick up on. So the characteristics of little children is that we talked about this last time, that they are the ones that have their sins forgiven for whose name's sake? I've got my sins forgiven. It's, it's because of the, power, the authority of the Lord. It's his namesake, it's not about us. We just enjoy the forgiveness of our sins. And then the latter part of verse 13, I brought unto you little children because what? You know the Father, you have a personal relationship with the Father, your sins are forgiven. It's not necessarily they just have that happened and I'm gonna be a young man pretty soon in the faith. Sometimes the, the Bible speaks about that graduation of growing to maturity. But the maturity just seen the family, we're all little children. We all should be young men. We all should be fathers in the sense of what does the father do? Because that's what's the characteristic of, of the fathers. And, and they're consistent in both uh, applications, like little children, little children, fathers, fathers. What about the fathers? You've known him for what? Okay. You've known him who is from <clears throat> the beginning. We talked about the beginning. And we, we look at the Gospel of John in the beginning, the word already was. So we know Jesus is eternal. But in these passages of the, of the beginning, uh, we've noted from the, very, from the very beginning, very start of the epistle, that it had to do with Jesus, I think, Jesus' incarnation. It wasn't the beginning of time. It's the beginning in which Jesus came in the flesh and began to present his word. For example, he, that which was from the beginning, which is the word of life, we've seen, we beheld, we handled concerning the word of life. It's from the beginning when his incarnation came. It's in verse 7. Beloved, no new commandment I write unto you, the old commandment which you have from the beginning. From the beginning of time? Or from the beginning of Jesus taking on flesh and blood and teaching us what love is. Self-sacrifice. That's why in John... Uh, what well, we talked about is an old commandment and a new commandment. It's, it's something that is new in the sense that uh, it was self-sacrifice or the basis of it so we can understand what love is. And then it was from, uh, it's old because it's been coming and it's consistent with when the gospel was being preached to them. And I think that it harmonizes throughout the epistle uh, that from the beginning Yes, Jesus already was when the beginning of world came. But from the beginning of his incarnation, because that's the problem. People were denying that Christ came in the flesh. They believe Jesus came in the flesh, but he's not Christ. He's not the Son of God. The Son of God can't touch flesh. Because flesh is uh, sinful. And the Spirit is what is perfectly uh, holy and we're going to get rid of that flesh one day. Either we'll get rid of it now, and that we're not going to give in to anything to the flesh. We're not going to get married. We're not going to eat this. We're not going to eat that. Or we'll just give in to it. Because it's not us sinning. Remember 1 John 1? There are people saying we haven't sinned. Who have you ever known said they haven't sinned? I've never met the person. But they had them running around here. Why? 
because that was my flesh in him. Dualism became Gnosticism. And so that's the kind of the background that we've already looked at as we come into this, this section. So the Father has known him who is from the beginning. Well, you can say, well, Jesus wasn't from the beginning. In the beginning already was. But from the beginning, Jesus took on flesh and blood is a key point that they, it wasn't, he wasn't a ghost. He didn't seem to be that. He could touch him. They could, they had, we talked about the senses that are setting forth there. So understanding that, that here the fathers, they've known him who is from the beginning, that, that doctrine hasn't changed. And I think that's part of, we've, we've known him. And the maturity part of us will say that's, that is not, that's not going to change. Now, question number 10, how can we overcome the evil one? This is where we pick up on the young men. You young men are strong. And uh, this is that, that time of your life where your, your strength is at its uh, probably best. And, uh, and that's, he takes, he takes that, that point across. So let's, let's talk about how, how are you going to uh, be strong? God abiding in you. All right. God abiding, his word abiding in you. That's how he does that. And so verse uh, verse. A lot of part of verse 13. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Satan himself? Yeah. Devil? <clears throat> and then, what does he say in, in, as we go into verse 14? When he says, I've written unto you young men because you're strong. And what abides in you? The word of, the word of God abideth in you. Now, that's, that's, God doesn't abide in us personally, but his word abides in us, doesn't he? And that's, that's, that's the power. That's our connection with, with God. But he's abiding in us through his word. That's why the Holy Spirit abides in us through the word that he inspired. And so it abideth in you, you and you have overcome the evil one. So I'm in this Bible class and said, how can I be strong spiritually, God? You came to the right class because there are no gray areas to hear. There's not, well, uh, maybe so. No, this is it. You're going to be strong when the word of God abides in you. Now, I'd just like to pause. What is your concept of the word abiding in you? A lot of times in, in, in John's epistle, that's why uh, you take beginning Greek, you'll, you'll translate uh, things of John because they're pretty simple Greek. But you'll, we'll come across, and we've seen it already in the first chapter, of the present tense, that it is something that is, is present and, and continues to follow. And, he, and it, in my Bible, when it says abideth, it's present tense, every time. Abideth, he didn't say abided, or did say, he did say just abides, but American standard's a little dated, but it, I know good and well, I've got confidence that when I say it says abideth, uh, it is the present tense in the Greek. And so it, it continues, how does, Practical speaking, how would you say, what does that mean? You know, it wasn't well, for God to dwell in me. We know, or it's through his word. How, how does the word of God abide in you? When do you know it's abiding in you? And what does it mean from God's perspective that it abides in you? It continues to abide in you. How, how did you uh, read it every second today? All right. And, you, and you're going to have to follow it because it, it's not coming in and out, though our reading does that. Abideth means it's continually there because you take in what it says and you build your faith, as you're saying. Uh, what makes your conscience? You go against your conscience. What does that indicate? Maybe the Word of God's abiding in you. Your conscience is bothering you if you do that. You may plan ahead. And it may be sin. But you know good and well, that's wrong. Why? Because the word of God's abiding. It's with you at that moment. And when we, we know what God would have us to do so we don't violate our conscience, we know what's right. Uh, how many decisions were you asked to, to make or, or people asked to do things that you knew what's right and what's wrong based upon the fact you know the Bible? You've read it, but more importantly, it is a part of your life that you can deal with the things that 
that come around and that might lead you astray. And that's, that's what we're going to see in the latter part of this chapter as well. But I, I think Jesus appealed to the scriptures to overcome Satan. He didn't go find a, a encyclopedia. He didn't go, well, let me go get the scroll and I'll be right with, back with you, Satan. Uh, oh, yeah, it is written over here. Or you got to go ask somebody. You just know it is written. And so love the heart of God with all thy heart. So in mind, and, and I'm not going to bow down to you. It is, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That sort of thing. So it's very practical of what we do. Memorization is important. I don't care how old you are, you can still memorize. You can work on it. Now, I, I want to get the scriptures in my, my heart. I'd like to go out of this world having the word of God on my heart where I'm not having to read it. I know I can quote it. Uh, that would be a great way to live life and live the latter days and, and just defy the idea, well, you can't, you can't learn anything after whatever age. It's my memory shot, and I'm just going to have to live with that. I, you can work on it. And uh, you'd be surprised what you can memorize if you, if you work on it. And that could be in your heart. So it's not, I can, I can quote scripture. We're not necessarily biting with you. You may go against it. But when your heart is in tune and that knowledge has not been wasted, Lord, I want to know how to build my life on your truth, then that will work with you and you will be with you. And you'll kind of know what side of the page it's on because it's so much a part of your, your daily routine. And that it, it's, it's, Bible reading is a practical part. Memorization is a practical part of living the Christian life. Because I think, well, the word abides in me. It continues to abide in you. And the only way that happens, you're meditating upon it. It's continually an important part of your life. Any, any comments? David, you had a point you want to make? <laughs> Yes, it, and David, I know you know this too because it's probably happened to you. You kind of know where they go to get their passages. I could probably refute their doctrine because they take it out of context. There you know that word. You know it's context. And you, this, this context, they're going to change. And uh, so we, we grow in that. We can be, we can be uh, better students of the word, help people see their error when they, they put these passages up. But I, I just think it's something we have to constantly feed our hearts with God's word. And I just appreciate you here tonight in midweek uh, do, doing that. Any, any other questions about uh, that strength so far? All right, look at question number 11. How do we love the world? And the point is, we're not to love the world. God loved the world. One of these passages you memorize, God sold up the world. Well, God didn't sin. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we've got to make some, uh, some distinctions here. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. My knowledge is limited, and I, I, I should, I, I'm going to try to work this out. So let's work it out together. God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his son. He loved the world in the sense that it's made up of people. And he gave up his son so they could uh, not die in their sins. So they wouldn't perish. That's the love that I value the people who comprise the world that I want to save them. I can have that kind of love. You can. That's what, that's what makes personal workers out of us. That we love the souls of mankind. John's talking about something else. And so this part here, if I do this, love the world, what am I doing? What's that? Well, I know that's negative. I want to know what I'm doing, positive, that's wrong. 
Well, that's right. But he said, he distinguishes this. He loved not the world, neither the things that are in the world. They must be different. They're connected. But how does it, neither this. I must, what does it mean to love the world, David? So we're attached to them. That's part of being, I love them. But that hasn't answered my question. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to realize if there's a distinction. Maybe there's not. Maybe you're, it's just our attachment to the world. But Corinthians speaks about the God of this world hath blinded the hearts of the people that the glory of the gospel doesn't shine on them. But God of this world, who's that? In that context, it's the devil. And there's a mindset of the world that I'm not to love. It is, it is the world's attitude and what you might want to make a connection, it's the things around us, it's the world, but it's the mindset, our mindset toward them. That then leads to connecting with them, connects to loving them. But I value, and, and the word love here is a love that says I value you. I can value the soul of my enemy, that's why I'm to love my enemy, because that agapeo. I don't like them. I don't want to be around them. But I'm going to love them to help them when they have, have need. So it is the worldly mindedness that filters into this. But I'm not to love the mindset of this world that is very self-centered, selfish, serve yourself. Don't, you don't have to serve others. That is... We walk according to the course of this world. Well, we all do. What's the matter with that? Because it's according to the dictates of Satan. I don't love that world. And yet, every time I sin, I've acted just like the world acts. I've, I've fought, and and we, we have to battle sin, even as we're Christians. So I don't want to value that, the, the mindset that is set forth by Satan that, that you take shortcuts and get into the glory of heaven like with, he did with Jesus. But it is a world that is that here are the things that govern me. So the worldly mindset, now we get into your connection. There's nothing sinful and everything I see or that feels good to me, lust of the flesh, are uh, being accepted by my peers, the pride of life. But when we value them, that where we will compromise the, the value of God and his word, that's where we're going to have, have trouble. It is our attitude toward things that become sinful. But don't go past this real quick. Well, it just, it just means this. No, loving the world is different than how God loved the world. So I've got that separated but I, I love the world, is that it's materialism. It is, it is a mindset that that's all there is. I want to go that route. So it's important that of the things I focus in upon becomes an important thing in my life. So if I love the mindset of this world, the love of the Father is not in me because they're totally opposite. I want to follow the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of men. And you got Paul in, in 1 Corinthians. What was the... What was the uh, crucifixion of Christ. What was that to the Gentiles? Foolishness. That's the natural man that can only see the things that are, uh, are physical and not see the, the spiritual background behind things. Uh, that's, the way, that's the way the world acts. That's the way the world is. And it's what follows uh, principalities and the powers of the air, Satan himself. That's the course of this world. And I don't, I don't love that. You don't love that. That's, but whenever we start uh, paying attention to that and we begin to value that, that's what this love is about. Valuing that, we're, we're in trouble. So he speaks about these things. So let's, let's take it to the next step. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
and how does he talk? So I, I, I get a new car, and uh, I'm not supposed to love that? Okay, I'll just like my new car. Okay, are you happy now? You know, we, we, we value we, we, the things that are around us, our food, we can't love. No, we've got to like it. Well, that may work. But neither the things in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in. For all that is in the world, and this is where Derek went, in the love of the world. So what's in the world? It's not the things that's the problem. It's our lust toward them, right? That's, so the problem is with me, not in God's wonderful creation. Or the things that, that we need for our uh, sustenance. Yes, That's right. Our, to, to your point, Paul, Paul in 1 Timothy 6 talks to rich people and, and they say he's given us all things to enjoy. And that's what your point is. And that's, that's right. Going off to a vacation somewhere in the woods, enjoy it. Uh, that's not love in the world, is it? I mean, it's enjoying the beauty of it because we see things from his perspective, not Satan's. And when, when our lust becomes that I'm going to satisfy my lust instead of God's word. Like, I'm going to commit fornication when that's safe for marriage. There's the battleground. If I'm going to serve my lust, uh, you could, I mean, it, it's prevalent today to just have an affair. It's okay. It's not okay with God, but it's okay with this world. And that becomes the difference. The lust of the eyes, what I see, the vainglory of life or the pride of life. And I know you know this. But it's interesting to me, that's the only three ways that Satan has ever tempted us. You know, here are 15 ways. Uh, no, three. It happened in the Garden of Eden. It happened with Jesus in the wilderness. It's happened to Christians here, isn't it? And you can put them all in those categories. Lust of my flesh, what I see, what I feel, what I see, and my pride. Does man have a lot of pride? Do we all have an ego? I guarantee you have an ego. You guarantee we have we got to keep it in check, don't we? If you don't have an ego, you're not worth much. I mean, our our whole country is worth on our our government is that people have an ego. It's set up where you would care enough about your particular part of the government that you'll fight for it because you have an ego. You you have uh, and, and and that's important. I I love others as I love myself. You have to have that, but we've got to keep it in check. And the pride of men says, I know something that you don't know, and we'll take people off in that direction. Uh, we've been, the last few days, that guy stole fancy luggage. Was it? I don't have luggage like this. It's not Samsonite or something, but it's, it's Verable or whatever it is. It's, it's real expensive luggage. Why would you have expensive luggage like that? But well, it's sitting at the, at the thing, and people are looking, and uh, they know the name that's connected with it. And what does that do? That must be a pretty special person, because that, that, that didn't think cost, that's not less than two, what, 2,500 bucks. And it's just the name recognition. It's not any better, but it's pride. And our world's full of that. That's the way the world works. Spend you $2,500 like that. And uh, that really showed, and maybe they went in debt to do that, but they're, they're going to have their moment. And that's the way the devil works on us. They always have. How are we going to be strong against the evil one? The word of God's going to bite in us and realize, I mean, steward of my money, I know what I've got. I've got an abiding treasure that nobody can take from me. And God just destroyed all the Bitcoin, you know, his, his work. you're going to have guys like that come along and, and well, uh, those are things of this world. But nobody can steal. Nobody can come in and steal your treasures in heaven. And that becomes the important thing. That's thinking like God and not like the world. And we don't, we, we're not going to value that. Question 12. What two facts should strengthen us against loving the world?
Let's read this together and see if you don't pick out the, the two. But he says, for all that's in the world, that's the flesh, that's the eyes, the vain glory of life, it's not only the Father, but it's the world. The world passeth away. Did I, should I remember that? The world's passing away. All of the things that I think are important, it's passing away, and the lust thereof. That's what I thought was so important. That luggage is going to pass away. So the world passeth away, but he that doeth the will of God does what? It didn't say, uh, you know, everybody's spirit is, going to, is eternal, and it is. We're going, to, we're going to be existing in hell, living in heaven. But the one who does what? Who does the will of God. That's the person that abides forever with the blessings of eternal life. If I get those two things in my mind, I don't get attached to this world. So I can enjoy every moment of a sunrise, sunset, vacation trip, getting away, you know, living in the woods and or living, you know, live, kind of enjoying the nature and all of those things, always realizing God. How, what a wonderful God that created beauty. And you, you, can, you can try to work on the definition of that, but you know it when you see it. A lot of times it's in nature. It has its own beauty. I remember living in West Texas, and the dunes out there was a sense of beauty to me. It's just a bunch of pile of sand. And go pound sand. I said, okay, I think I will today. <laughs> it has its own, its own beauty. And we can enjoy that. And, and God said, I've given you all things to enjoy. But it's always in the context that when you see that, realize who, who allowed you to have it. And I've got something planned for you beyond this world. And the world passeth the way. Why get all serious about it? Whether it's materialism or politically connected, or all, all that's going to pass away. But I tell you, I'm not going to pass away. I'm, I'm going to remain relevant because I'm going to do the will of God. And I'm on, I'm on his side. We talk a lot about uh, I want to be on the right side of history. Well, I tell you, the only way you can be the right side of history is to be a Christian. And you will be, because Jesus is the beginning of history. He's eternal nature coming to this world. He's the beginning of this history. He's going to bring it to a close as well. All right, any, any comments you have there? You want to add to that? Let's go lesson four. What two characteristics? Now, we get, it, we get into the uh, Antichrist, and he's addressing uh, little children. So what two characteristics does John reveal that would stand out and contradict the modern religious belief of the Antichrist? Are we familiar with the Antichrist that's going to come? According to what is broad the dispensationalist? If you live long enough, who's been the Antichrist? Hitler, it, time's coming. He's, he's the Antichrist. Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, he becomes the Antichrist. I can work out his, na his name, will work out, he'll 666, he'll come out there. <laughs> All the different things of, that, of, of the Antichrist. So it's the Antichrist that's going to come and there'll be a great war in Armageddon and he'll set up his kingdom. Depending on how people uh, look at what will he reign before or reign after. Well, premillennialism is that he will come before he reigns. Alexander Campbell was a postmillennialist. That's why, he's, why he wrote his magazine uh, was, was the Millennial Harbinger. He was going to be so great that he will bring in his, his, his kingdom and then he'll come in his kingdom. Because they were saving souls. They, it was a very positive look. But you don't find them anymore. Because our world's dark. And people do that. But you'll find dispensationalists, premillennialists is what in our generation we know. So it's a particular antichrist. And I've said, all right. He's going to come at 
at the end of time. It is a particular person in history, and it, it changes a lot. What does John say here? He said, there's two things there that misses. That's right. There are many antichrists. And they're already here. And why can't people look at that? Well, I said, well, this is going to be at the end of time. Well, little children, this is, this is in the latter part of the first century. So here are the Christians. Everybody's, everybody's little children. Now we're looking at little, my little children, John's relationship with them. It is the last hour. And as you heard, that Antichrist cometh. Even now have there arisen many Antichrists. Therefore, thereby we know, and he doubles down. Thereby we know it's the what? It's the last hour. Now, let me refresh your memory. Does this trouble you? That in the first century it was the last hour, and we're still here? I thought we're, we're going to heaven, and uh, it's the last hour. And so you start looking at it, and, and, and how, how troubling can it be? He didn't say it was the last days. Oh, you may say, well, he means the same thing. Well, he makes a distinction, Jesus does, between day and hour. And if we were just take, without a, worrying about where it's going to lead me, if we're just going to stay, last hour, I don't, it's the last seconds? <laughs> It's the last minutes. I don't. Bible doesn't speak about that. But when's the last hour? It it can happen any time. And I think that's what he's saying. And it's still that way. It's not saying the last hour, and therefore the Bible contradicts itself because he didn't come. And that we need to understand, and without shying away from it, like Matthew Matthew twenty four, uh, the day or the hour. Does anyone know the Lord's going to come? Only the Father. And then in the passage leading up to chapter 25 with all of the uh, end of time judgment parables, he offers this that, that we, are we going to be a servant that is going to think he's going to delay his coming? And then he'll come and the day which he's not expecting it, and the hour that he knoweth not? Does he make a distinction? There's day, that's a little bigger, bigger time, but right, is he being precise? I think so. He's being precise when he uses the word hour. But we know in Acts 2 and 17 that the beginning of, of, of the gospel of Christ, saving men from their sins, this was in the last days. The Holy Spirit will come. He did. So I'm, we both know that. All of us know that. That's the last days. We have other passages, Hebrews 1. At the end of these days, God has spoken unto us through his what? At the end of these days, he's spoken unto us. His son, thank you. And that's, and that's Jesus Christ. And the last days, 2 Timothy 3, there'll be men coming, and uh, some of them will have a form of knowledge, and he says also avoid them. He's writing to Timothy. You know, you know 60 A.D., and he said, Timothy, these people are going to come in the last days. You avoid them. He was living in the last days. So last days kind of starts with the gospel starting. And uh, kind of like we're looking at the beginning of, of the gospel that we, we've been able to know the gospel since it, it began with Christ. And I just think it is serious that you be alert because we're in the last hour. We're not having Christ come. Christ has been here a while, and we're having people against him. What does the word anti mean? I, I, okay, what, what does that mean? If you're an anti, what are you? You're against things. You're against things. And so, and I'm against Christ. Well, I know our time is short, but if that's, if that's true, could, could you tell me Precisely how he defines the Antichrist for us? That's the effect of it. That's true. They're not denying Father. But they exist. But they, the effect of, of what I'm looking at will bring forth your point. What is verse 22? 
Who is this Antichrist? Who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? What's the rest of the verse? This is the what? There's the answer. Now, Ali's, Ali's point, when I do that, he's trying to say, when, when you start denying he, you're denying the Father. So you, you will deny both the Son and the Father. He's, well, I just deny Christ. You're denying the Father because it's his Son. And what, what are you you're saying there, and it's back to our point, that Jesus is the right. They did not deny Jesus, that Jesus existed. When Jesus comes in the world, what would you look at? That's a 12-year-old boy. That's a 30-year-old man. He's a man. They had no problem with that. But when you make him the Christ, which is the son of the living God, isn't that our good confession? Isn't that what Peter said? I believe thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. God cannot inhabit flesh. Off the table. Isn't that against Christ? Very definitely. Because Jesus is Christ. Jesus came in the flesh. Well, it came upon him, the, the Christ part came upon him at his, at his baptism, and it left him on the cross. No. His blood testimony is, gives a testimony that indeed the Holy Spirit's right when Jesus is the Christ. So our understanding of this epistle of John, well, when we have that grounding, I think you'll just come back to it. You realize why this was such a, important to deny, to die Jesus? Exists? No, they did not. They did not. That his Christ, he just came on him at his baptism and left him on the cross. He really wasn't. It just appeared. There was the appearance of that. He really wasn't at all. And what John is saying, that's the one that you better be aware of, because he can lead people astray. And that was the beginning of of the, of the Gnosticism that was taking place. Any questions? Or you see what? A, when you deny Jesus Christ is coming, or Jesus is coming, the, or Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, you don't have the Father and you don't have the Son. But the point is, you don't have the Son because you deny who He is, but you don't have the Father either. And this becomes a very important. If we go beyond the doctrine of Christ, we don't have the Father in Second John. So they're connected. They're, they are, and we and that's they're walking in the light. They're, they're, they are the light. We need to walk in that light. Okay. I know our time is short. Does anyone have something you want to add, add to that? What? I like to hear. Do you have? If I confused you on the last hour, I, to me, that's taking it right up to the time of if he could come back any time, and he could have. We're to be prepared for that at this point, but it's, there's, there's not going to be any other Christ. Thank you. Any other Christ to come? And the Antichrist is already here. You know it's the last hour. I mean, all the last days are here. Days, but we're, it's the last hour. There's nothing else going to happen uh, between the, either people going to be against Christ, as they were here. Uh, Christ is already here. He's already come. Kingdom's already set. And that should sober our thinking. He can really come anytime. Because I think we're also in the last hour. Even though it may be another thousand years but we we've got to be ready for it don't we so we'll uh we'll start here sunday our quarter quarters change so we'll begin this lesson where we left off and that might be real good so it's fresh in your mind and we'll start our epistles of john Job switches to wednesday night and uh i hope that does all right don't come with Job. Lesson Sunday. You can, but uh, we'll go be first, John. It's always confusing, but we'll we'll do it together. Thank you.